We have three incredible speakers today, all from the Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities. Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Yiling Pan, the Executive Director of Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities. Um, in this presentation, we will be uh, discussing how communities specific trauma in best uh, in best Asian American communities and why the culturally responsive and trauma informed crisis care is essential and effectiveness of worse intervention strategies for primary, secondary, and connective trauma by is man, uh, is managing the specific MHACC programs. Now I will let our program managers, Rosalyn Chi and Rachel Chen. Thank you for the introduction, Elaine. Um, so in addition to everything Elaine just mentioned, in the latter part of the presentation, we will also be discussing how institutional racism and internalized stigma create barriers to mental health care of pe uh, for people of, of color. And we'll be talking about some techniques for promoting anti-racism and interracial solidarity within mental health spaces. Overall, we want to try to provide a comprehensive understanding of the unique mental health challenges faced by Asian American communities under the resurgence of anti-Asian hate um, and offer some practical tools and strategies for addressing them. So whether you're a mental health practitioner, researcher, or simply someone interested in promoting mental health equity, we hope to bring you some valuable insight. So our first section of the presentation will focus on the topic of community-specific trauma. I think most of us here would agree that feeling safe and secure in our own communities should be a fundamental right. But sadly, certain groups in the US have long been the target of violence and discrimination. As you might be aware, in recent years, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a shocking increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Studies have shown that the people who commit these atrocious acts are often repeating the rhetoric that they hear from political figures and candidates who blame China for issues such as public health crises and economic downturns. This is called scapegoating, which is not a new phenomenon to the country. Minority groups have been blamed for social and economic issues throughout the history of this country, leading to violent and exclusionary policies. Of course, the COVID-19 crisis has only fueled this pattern of scapegoating with Chinese communities being specifically targeted by inflammatory political rhetoric. Again, the rise of hate incidents throughout the country always echo this harmful rhetoric as recorded by Stop AAPI Hates Reporting Center. It's important to note that these incidents don't just target Chinese people in America, but Asian Americans in general, because honestly, people who hold these types of beliefs don't bother to distinguish between Asian ethnicities. To give you a better understanding of the severity of anti-Asian hate, uh, here are some basic stats on hate crimes. The number of hate crimes in the US actually increased in 2020 to the highest level it's been at in 12 years. In California alone, the number of reported anti-Asian hate crime events went up by 107% in 2020. Between March 19th, 2020 and March 31st, 2022, Nearly 11,500 hate incidents were, were reported to stop AAPI Hates Reporting Center in the US. But what constitutes a hate crime? Hate crimes are criminal acts that are motivated by bias against a person or groups, real or perceived race, ethnicity, religion, disability, or other identity factors. Throughout the pandemic, the Asian American community has faced numerous counts of discrimination, physical assault, and even murder. Unfortunately, many Asian Americans still live in fear of these terrible acts happening to them or their loved ones. Hate crimes not only cause physical harm to its victims, they also have serious mental health consequences. Studies have shown that people who are victims of hate crimes 
are more likely to experience psychological distress than victims of other violent crimes. Victims of hate crimes are particularly at risk for post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, and anger issues. In addition to affecting individuals, hate crimes also victimize and negatively impact the entire community. When a member of a group is targeted, it sends a message to the other members that they are also at risk. Also, for Asian Americans, these mental health issues can be particularly difficult to address because of the model minority myth. It perpetuates the false belief that all Asian Americans are successful, hardworking, and immune to hardship, which can erase the very real struggles and challenges that many of us face. It's also important to note that there is an institutional alienation of Asian Americans when it comes to research focused on their health. In fact, the NIH has invested only 0.17% of funding altogether for clinical research for Asians, Hawaiians, and Alaskans over the past 26 years. So it's important to not only consider individual mental health struggles, but also the collective struggles that come from being a member of a victimized or underserved group. The healthcare system in the US contains so many barriers that make it difficult for people to access affordable, affordable mental health care, especially for minority groups. And that's only looking at things from an individual perspective. There is no system in place that adequately addresses collective or community trauma. That's where MHACC comes in. We want to fill this gap by providing free, accessible, culturally responsive, and trauma-informed care to Chinese Americans. But we don't stop there. We also want to build collective resilience and raise awareness of mental health within the Chinese community. That's why we also engage in advocacy, education, and research in addition to our mental health services. The reason we have chosen to do these specific things comes from a place of understanding the types of issues we are addressing. So let's now take a closer look at the mental health impact of anti-Asian racism, examining the different ways in which harm is experienced and placing them into three broad categories. Research shows that exposure to violence, whether through direct personal experience or indirectly through the media can have adverse effects on mental well-being. And of course, the incidence of both types of exposure has increased in recent years for Asian Americans specifically. At MHACC, we separate the different forms of trauma caused by anti-Asian hate into three categories, primary, secondary, and as I mentioned before, collective. Primary trauma is acute or chronic trauma due to firsthand experiences. For example, in the context of anti-Asian hate, an Asian American individual can become traumatized if they are attacked or physically threatened with violence based on their race. And this can manifest as PTSD symptoms, such as hypervigilance, nightmares, anxiety, and so on. Secondary trauma is when someone experiences similar types of PTSD symptoms, but caused by indirect exposure to traumatic material. And this can occur to family members or close friends of victims who witness or hear about a traumatic event or people who need to care for a victim in the aftermath of such an event. Finally, as the social ecological model shows, personal and environmental factors can jointly affect behavior and therefore how trauma can experienced trauma can be experienced by a community as a whole. Community trauma can lead to a sense of shared suffering and can have profound effects on the collective memory of a group, identity and culture of a group. Community can be here defined geographically in terms of a neighborhood or virtually in terms of a shared identity. So the obvious example of this here would be how the overall resurgence of anti-Asian hate crimes has exacerbated the pervasive fear amongst Asian Americans of being targeted and marginalized. In this same category is the intergenerational transmission of trauma, which is especially prominent for minority groups. These three forms of trauma are in interdependent. What that means is that an adverse community environment can make it harder for individuals to recover from trauma. And traumatic events can have a ripple effect on the larger community. And that's why it's crucial to provide trauma-informed care 
that takes into account the unique individuals of individual unique needs of individuals impacted by anti-Asian violence, while also considering the larger social and cultural context that can influence recovery. Some individuals may require long-term mental health support, while others may benefit from more from short-term solutions. Individual struggles are typically addressed through therapy and support, but collective trauma requires a community-wide approach to healing, as well as the rehabilitation of unhealthy public spaces that the community inhabits. At MHACC, we prioritize a peer support and education approach, which means the lived experiences of the teachers, presenters, and facilitators is the heart of MHACC programs. Peer support is a crucial intervention strategy when it comes to trauma-informed care. It boils down to the fact that people need people. In the field of behavioral health, the term peer refers to someone who has shared experiences of living with a psychiatric disorder and or addiction. Peer support at MHACC involves connecting individuals to specialists who have experienced similar traumas and providing a safe and supportive environment for them to share their experiences. So trauma-informed peer support practices are all about creating a safe space for individuals to support one another without the power imbalance present in traditional mental health settings. At MHACC, our peer specialists provide support that is culturally responsive and in language for Chinese American individuals. We also offer classes in Mandarin and Cantonese, like NAMI peer-to-peer and family-to-family classes, Mental Health First Aid, and Mental Health 101 to educate patients, their family members, and other caregivers on how to care for themselves or their loved ones who are struggling. For caregivers, it's particularly important to know how to manage transference and secondhand trauma. And because we want to make sure that our services are accessible to as many as possible, we use technology to provide support in a variety of ways, like our online peer and family support groups offered in English, Mandarin, and Cantonese, a mental health warm line, and a 24-7 WeChat support group. We also have two free mobile apps, one for patients and one for caregivers, so people can access the resources and peer support they need easily through their phones. But we know that addressing trauma caused by hate crimes requires strategies at both the individual and community levels. Typically, interventions at the individual level take place after a person has experienced trauma, but addressing trauma at the community level requires a greater emphasis on prevention. This involves building healthy communities to prevent potentially traumatic events from occurring. So at MHACC, we focus on both prevention and intervention techniques so that we can offer a holistic approach to addressing trauma on both levels. And now I will pass things off to Rachel to talk about the programs we have at MHACC to address community trauma. Thank you, Rosalind. So first off, I'll start by um, addressing fear and community trauma. So symptoms of community trauma can often be traumatic themselves, and this often can lead to a cycle of traumatic events such as crime, struggling economies, and reduced collective efficacy, and which is this, uh, which is a neighbor's willingness to intervene for the common good. And these factors are often really um, deeply interconnected, and there are some ways we seek to counter community trauma symptoms and protect the community from further trauma. So as you can see on the slides, at MHACC, we prevent violent crimes and foster collective efficacy through our patrol and crisis rescue teams. And for over two years, so nearing the start of the pandemic, our dedicated volunteers have been patrolling Chinatown on a daily basis and braving through all sorts of weather conditions and so far, we've intervened in a total of 74 incidents during this two-year period and have made 37 calls to request police assistance. Uh, we also lead efforts towards social empowerment through hand holding rallies and community events such as the Chinese New Year Parade in order to sort of reclaim our voices and celebrate our culture with our community. And we firmly believe in the power of social connections and strengthening the unity between Chinese individuals which is an integral um, part of creating a sense of community. Also, MHACC does hold many virtual recreational programs, 
such as daily Zumba, Tai Chi, mindfulness and singing classes that are free and open for all to attend. And we also offer the food delivery services that ensures that vulnerable members of our community are still able to fulfill their basic needs despite the difficulty of their circumstances. So in these waves, we carve out spaces of belonging for marginalized individuals in order to make them feel supported, connected, and encouraged to engage in healthy behaviors. And far, finally, as part of our mission to affect positive change, we often engage in political advocacy on behalf of our community, and which you can see on the bottom corner of the slide. We actively, we are actively involved in supporting legislative initiatives such as the SB 803, which has enabled California to allow certification of peer support specialists, and AB 2022, which um, was passed, or I believe was passed by former assembly member Kansen Chu, which requires schools to notify pupils and parents how to access the available mental health services on campus in whether it's on campus or in their community. And we have been involved with that one, I believe, since it was local and state and the federal level. We also have Care Court and then the Care First Prison Blast. We also conduct large scale publicity campaigns to raise awareness about issues affecting our community and to push for change. And here at MHACC, we also believe that the political advocacy is critical component of our work in order to minimize the inequities that minority groups encounter and in turn reducing community trauma. And next I'll be handing it back to Rosalind to speak about anti-racism and mental health. Yeah, so I mean, here on the slide, you have some images of the work and advocacy that we do. Um, finally, thank you, Rachel. Uh, we have to talk about how important it is to address racism and build solidarity across different races when it comes to mental health advocacy. As I've mentioned, mental health care is not equally accessible for everyone in our country. Overall, African Americans, Latinx, and Asian Americans are getting treated at rates 50 to 70 percent lower than white Americans. This is partly due to the stigma surrounding mental health in our communities, but also because the system itself is stacked against racial minorities. For example, data collection and policy metric systems often fail to accurately represent minorities, and there's a lack of mental health providers who speak ling languages other than English. So it's crucial that we work together to address these systemic issues. Some specific ways to foster interracial solidarity in mental health spaces are empathizing with the violent harm experienced by other minority groups, building trust and communication there and creating opportunities for meaningful dialogue. In that same vein, we should work together on strengthening democracy overall and challenging the systems that prevent some voices from being heard. Um, we should encourage mental health inclusivity, for example, debunking the model minority myth for Asian Americans, reducing culturally derived mental health stigma, promoting help seeking behaviors, and finally, just supporting culturally competent care and treatment practices that are sensitive to a diversity of needs and experiences. By working together across these racial and ethnic lines, we can create a better mental health care system that meets the needs of everyone. To get together, we can also build healthier and more resilient communities where everyone has access to the support and care they need. Communities that can recover from collective trauma and more importantly, fight against the cycles of violence and disparities that are born from it. Thank you for your attention and engagement in hearing our side of this important conversation. Thank you all so much for this incredible presentation.